So um, welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke and I do run the Siegel Theater Center. It's the very end of the semester, it's the end of the year, it's our very last uh, program. Students uh, are already gone, are already out and New York City has switched into the busy holiday mode. But we feel um, we always start with something important and significant. We always end with something important and significant, not only for spring and fall, but also for the year. And uh, we thought that our focus, which we have today, building audiences for contemporary circus, especially also in New York, is something that um, we have to focus on, that we should think about, that should be on our radar and not under the radar. And um, I'm a strong supporter of this work, which is exciting. It's looking forward. It's Théâtre Populaire. It's real public theater in a way. It has many, many answers, I think, for questions um, that uh, theater and uh, performance uh, poses us, who does it, for whom, where, and why. I think the body is involved, it's embodied, but also that new wave of uh, of circus that came perhaps a bit more from France, but also from around the world. It's a global movement, and we are thrilled and excited to be in a little, our little way, part of it. And we support things um, that are emerging, and we uh, are do things that are not yet always uh, fully uh, emerged. When we talked uh, on Monday with Jed, he said, maybe this is a little bit a moment, like when the New York avant-garde started in the 70s and 80s, it was not really known. So we do things nobody else does, at least at universities or others. And we take a stand and we really do say, this is something seriously important. It's uh, a future of the performing arts. And in the 21st century and 22nd century, this will be a focus, I think. Um, or for audiences alike, and it really covers uh, from young adult children, theater, family entertainment, but also especially now with these new developments that as we wrote in our uh, invitations for everybody to watch in, it is no longer the good old circus like we saw in this afternoon with the historic documentary. Something has radically changed. And of course we think for the better. We have with us presenters, presenters who have uh, decades long often experience of presenting work, of presenting circus, contemporary circus, and actually very successfully in a time where audience uh, members in our traditional theaters um, uh, are uh, are dwindling. We do know that they're up down to 50% in some audiences. Uh, the big theaters are down to four or five productions a year or have even halted this fall in New York City, has uh, seen how dramatic uh, this is. And uh, someone said the analog theater is having a hard time. So that's what they say in the digital world, um, uh, playing in games. But I think uh, this is something really exciting, something really important. And I would like to thank HowlRound, uh, as always, uh, for uh, being such a great host um, for our panels, which are live stream panels. And I welcome our audience here in the Siegel Center. And I would like to hand it over to uh, Ruth Wickler, who uh, has been a champion early on, I think, uh, nationally, but also globally, um, for what's called Nouveau Cirque, Contemporary Circus. And so I can't wait to hear more. And Ruth, I hand it over to you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you for um, shedding light on this discipline in this uh, hallowed halls of the Graduate Center. It's exciting. Um, so my name is Ruth Wickler, and I, uh, for the last five years, have been directing the International Market for Contemporary Circus in Montreal. I'm now on the West Coast working at Clark College in um, Vancouver, Washington, but um, I'm going to speak on behalf of this experience with the, with the, the circus market. Um, so I have a, we have a wonderful panel. Thank you, each of you, for coming and being part of this. Um, Lori Jones from the Quick Center, Jed Wheeler, Lindsay bullier Machiel, and Xavier Gobain. Thank you so much for being part of this. And a couple of folks who have submitted materials also um, online to share. Um, the focus really is on this angle of, of building audiences. So that's why we have more uh, presenter voice, um, because in some ways the work of a presenter is about uh, doing that matchmaking between artists and audiences, knowing audiences, knowing artists, and kind of weaving that connection. Um, and it is a, a project of, of many years to build audiences for this art form. Um, so I'm going to give a little introduction and then uh, also share some of the contributions from colleagues who are not here in person. 
So I invite my pa fellow panelists to turn around. <laughs> um, so this is an image from last summer um, in Montreal. We presented uh, at the Tohu a, um, a show called uh, um, The Pulse, which had 72 um, folks on tour. Um, it was a mammoth, um, large-scale contemporary work by Gravity and Other Myths of Australia, uh, working with the um, Girls' Choir of Catalonia. Um, quite a, quite a, I think that will go in the history books of, of large-scale uh, endeavors in this art form. So just a, just a kind of little context um, to frame things, you know, um, skipping to the very bottom point, um, the U.S. has an amazing, strong tradition of traditional circus. And that is both a help and a hindrance for developing audiences for contemporary circus. Um, this is also true in other countries, uh, other regions that also don't have uh, large government support for the arts and for contemporary arts and new creations. Um, so Latin America, Africa, and the U.S., um, you know, maybe they have amazing, you know, in in thousands of years, hundreds of years, traditions of circus, acrobatics, uh, ac all kinds of art forms that are related to ob object manipulation, visual theater, virtuosity, etc. But in an absence of, of government support for uh, creation of new contemporary expressions, um, there's a there's a challenge in uh, you know new companies making new work and sustaining that. It's just difficult, and that's true in every art form, but it's also especially true in circus. Um, so again, American mass entertainment is circus from the 19th century on. It's kind of a, at the very heart of our culture in America. So that's something we can certainly be proud of. I think um, uh, P.T. Barnum, you know, invented American marketing and spectacle. And, you know, th so the circus really is at the very, very heart of American culture, I would say. Um, Cirque du Soleil, which is, of course, based in Montreal, has has taken a, a very prominent place in American mass culture and made ensured that live entertainment remains part of mass commercial culture, even as you know, film and TV occupy that space in so many other ways, but Cirque du Soleil keeps circus at, you know, a, as a viable commercial part of commercial mass culture. Um, when we could talk about contemporary circus, though, I don't think we're really talking about commercial mass culture. So just to differentiate those in terms of semantics. Um, and then a lot of times when you hear about um, contemporary circus, we're going back to kind of a root period uh, of the transition from circus uh, being a, a, an art form that only was um, uh, developed by and performed by circus families. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. She flew in from uh, Saudi Arabia yesterday. <laughs> um, Okay, and uh, anyway, moving it from, you know, you would only perform circus if you were born into a circus family to you can be want to be a circus artist. And in order to do that, you can go to school and become one. So that kind of sh major shift that really started in this in France in the 70s. Um, and then, but of course, who's teaching in those schools? A lot of Soviet heritage, a lot of Chinese heritage. And so there's um, so a lot of through lines going through to what people are learning in the circus schools. But then um, the government art support, the legitimization of circus as an art form among other noble arts is uh, is kind of a key part of circus evolution into contemporary circus. And that the absence of that in the US is kind of, again, like I said, a bit of a marking point of, of um, our story. Um, and then when we talk about the, the work that we're going to talk about in this panel, I think a lot of it falls into the category of contemporary circus as a nonprofit touring performing art. So it's it's kind of a, if the circuits are less tense and self-producing and more festivals and venues, if the place of exchange is less competitions and more art markets, the, those are kind of the differentiation of what we're talking about. But circus itself, it, it still maintains a very vibrant commercial arm. It's still, you know, circuit circulates in tents 
Um, so it, it is many, many things. It also has, you know, children's parties and all the rest of it. So there, there's, there are many, many versions of this. And we're kind of speaking about one particular type. And I think we'll, we'll call it contemporary circus for what, for what it's worth. Okay. Um, so I just did a little rundown. I mean, everyone in this group kind of knows this, this history, but um, I, I did a little inventory on the left-hand side of, of circus in New York City and how um, it has has uh, important marking points, I would say. Um, one thing I will say is that Tohu was built in 2004. Um, so it's just having its 20th anniversary uh, this coming year. And the what Tohu, with its extraordinary amount of subsidy from the Quebec government, um, was able to do one-off presentations of international large scale circus works in a way that you know, regularly throughout the year and every summer. And that's just a the kind of scale of working that is un, without uh, parallel. Some of the works, because not everybody will be reading it from the house of the knowledge and yeah, so like a you know in, in New York City, BAM, the New Victory, and and Lincoln Center Festival have been presenting, started presenting international large scale circus works decades ago. Um, many companies have grown up here and and become established. Many of them have found their local presenters and homes. Um, uh, one thing to mention is that that the EU uh, supported a project that was. Tohu and then Circus Strata, which is the European network of circus arts that was that aimed to kind of develop a cohort of American presenters that would learn about circus and be, develop some fluency. And um, much of the circus that was presented, the international circus that was presented in the last couple of decades had its root in that educate presenter education work. It ended in 2015, so I think maybe it started in 2009. Is that ring a bell? Okay. Um, and so moving right forward to recent years, during the pandemic, um, you know, where I come in is that I was had to assume the direction of the International Market for Contemporary Circus, which is part of Tohu in Montreal um, in 2019, so that when the, the, um, the pandemic hit, it was kind of a key moment that both brought circus to its knees because as a touring art form with high dependent on dependence on international flow um, and bringing people together. It was very hobl humbl hobbling. Um, and yet it also opened up possibilities because uh, of the, um, anyone can join a Zoom. So in fact, um, we were well positioned with the MIC to really open the doors to anyone and everyone who might want to participate in a building of network for circus and uh, particularly presenting circus, and um, also brought together colleagues in our field of presenting to do be in working groups that met regularly. And so these relationships that um, had been once a year became ongoing, and they turned into friendships and trust relationships. And a lot, a lot, a lot of results have come out of this, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and anyway, so Lori is, uh, chair of our U.S. group, and Jed is chair of our commissioning group, and um, yeah. Okay, and a big, I want to also call out, Mark, and your work on the American Circus Alliance, which was also part of the uh, pandemic. So, um, you know, these are all really important evolutions, I think, of the sector. And I just wanted to shine one little light myself on the pitch sessions. Um, so the when we when we were doing the market online, second, um, the first pitch sessions we did online uh, increased the number of countries participating by dramatically. And what I'm going to show you is I made some scrawling marks around the um, the works that have been touring and even making North American debuts um, since as fruits of these pitch sessions. So as you can see, there's this weekend in New York City, white gold is represented here on this panel, that pitched in 2021, virtually. And uh, the Madagascar clowns, Zolabay, are also in New York City this weekend at Lincoln Center. 
and they pitched that for the first time at that pitch session as well. And I put a little check mark between behind uh, every all the works that I know toured in North America since then, and I I'm sure I'm missing some as well. These are just the ones that I know. Am I missing? Um, and then this is the the next one. You can see all the check marks. Um, so this is, you know, not every work that is submitted is selected. I think that we have we've had a jury, you know, jury around eight uh, jurists from around North America and around the world who whittle down um, the applications by about they they'll pick like about a fifty percent. And uh, but still the the and and that uh, that work of collective selection does a really important job of, of identifying what work will, will tour in North America well to the US audience and, and the Canadian audience. And so um, having so many check, these are all works that have subsequently toured. And I think I'm missing some as well, but it's pretty amazing actually, yeah. <laughs> um, because the number of companies that were touring prior, um, you know, there were some greatest hits, but it wasn't very many. And certainly the the, uh, the diversity of art artistically uh, has dramatically increased and the diversity of uh, global representation has dramatically increased. And this is last summer. So you have Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, South Africa. Um, finally, we got Japan and Korea um, uh, for the first time last year because of some, I went and, yeah. I went to those places, um, Taiwan. So anyway, this is, this has been quite a, a dramatic uh, change very, very quickly. Um, and I'm really proud of it. Um, should I show this or not? This one? Has everyone seen this? Okay. Okay, this is, this is a, a piece that came out of our commissioning group. Um, we presented it at our festival last summer and uh, it's a very wonderful clown piece from Mexico we just give a little treat of the trailer here the Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to just share. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to go back to. Okay. That's the end of my presentation. So now, now we'll go to the um, uh, Sonia Clark's presentation from Art Park. Wait, something's wrong with the sound. Hold on. This is not the sound that goes with this video. That's the phone. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Hi, welcome. But you can pull up some chairs here if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is from Sonia, um, whose theater is in Buffalo. Thank 
Um, thank you for this amazing opportunity. I'm Sonia Clark, I'm the president of the Court Court, and I'm here to talk to you remotely. Unfortunately, I couldn't join you in person. Uh, I want to talk to you about the art of outdoor circus and street theater as it relates to our organization, Art Court, in the context of public celebration. Instead of my talking head, I thought I'd put some pictures together in this chat along. So welcome on this journey and thank you so much for this opportunity. So our part is now celebrating its 50th anniversary and it has had at least three major reiterations of artistic connections with other locals. But what it always was uh, is a public park and a place where art has been presented in an accessible and permanent form. We have no other territorial objectives. I think we focus most on the experience of celebration. In curating circuit street theater, I focus primarily on that experience of the public celebration, the public laughter, not sarcasm, but the genuine sense of joy shared by thousands. Um, I see the site as the ultimate playground where play is inspired rather than structure. This, we use this poly 150 acres on the Niagara Gorge with a variety of public gathering spaces from parking lots and park clearings to formal stages to outdoor theater and the outdoor main stage with an adjacent lawn all present that perfect opportunity not only to experience artistic excellence but a chance to experience each other in an environment of most different kinds of social, social acceptance and joy. And it's certainly give our artists that opportunity to just go and play and when they're more than through the separate the own resources. We have a piece of picture that actually from our gals of celebration that was created uh, artistically organized by Skip Cherry and his friends who did really well and they keep being asked for more uh, similar celebrations. Uh, our patrons then was all about our gals to be that way going forward. In the past seven or so years, our first school nearly created a program that included companies like Silk Ranch from Hamilton, Canada, Joraquia in Estonia, Surf Bar Coach uh, in collaboration with Acting for Climate in Montreal, was Lucien Roland uh, from France, uh, who it about as a combination of a surf and opera from Spain, Franzini's from Ireland, my mother's surf from Montreal, many others. All of these have been presented in the context of larger public celebrations or pre existing outdoor festivals such as Art Park Caricos. Even when the tickets are sold for a specific show on occasion, for example, one of the Mississippi Milan shows was originally paired with a music show, Art Park Collective, and the next year with the show by Machine playing Pink Floyd. Ultimately, their third show was actually able to stand on its own and sold upwards of 3,000 tickets. The outdoor circuit street theater both fit perfectly into art parks, zeitgeist, cultural landscape. The combination of artistic excellence showcased by the highly specialized and capable circuit performers who open the fears out of this world with their extraordinary abilities, or go beyond what would be possible, mixed with a formal outdoor setting. But the audience make a lot of sense for our party, not public sense. The art of public spectacle is not so much as an art as a representation of life itself in a heightened form. Um, that's where the street theater with its roots in the museum for an evolved culture comes in. I find this art form particularly very relevant to our purpose. The ultimate benefit of bringing outdoor surf to our park is to cultivate the open minds in giving our audiences the permission to explore the new, the unusual, but ultimately very satisfying and ultimately leading to the love of many other cultures. It's an open door, it's an open invitation. Uh, this is what I value most for our fun. Well, this concludes our conversation about our park and Cirque and outdoor theater at our park. If I can be of any help, uh, Please reach out to ourpart.net. And thank you, Ruth. And enjoy this evening. Hopefully, I'll see you around and then planning our mutual seasons in the future. <laughs> One thing to say is that, you know, Sonia is just doing this because she believes in it. And, you know, it's not coming 
nothing's received. She hasn't inherited it. She has really, it's been real trail, trailblazing work. Whoops. Okay, now we have a contribution from Elena Sianko of PS21. in the United States. Rose Winkler, our colleague, thank you very much for organizing this conversation. And Frank Kenshko of the Siegel Center, thank you as ever for hosting this panel as well as, well, as, well as many wonderful events um, you have done in the past. And of course, to how around for disseminating this information. I'm Elena Sianko, Executive and Artistic Director of um, PS21, the Center for Contemporary Performance in the Hudson Valley that you see on this um, image. We have been presenting, we are a new institution and have been presenting circus uh, in the last three, four years with the first presentation of two international productions in 2021. One, um, uh, Cirque uh, Liberty War in December, and then um, another one uh, in the summer, uh, unstable by Laison Perche from France, a production that we shared with uh, Toho Montreal and that was originated by Rose Wakeland. Uh, I should mention here um, to all my colleagues how much we benefited from Nick and our participation, and also, of course, the generosity of Rose and also building the community for contemporary service in the United States. While I speak, I will be sharing with you images of our campus as well as some of the productions that we presented. A contemporary circus did not um, come as a random um, thing in our programmatic agenda. It very much uh, was part of what um, we devised as our Pathways initiative, an initiative that we launched uh, during the pandemic year in 2020 which is um, a series of spectacle participatory immersive events, international programs in our trails, but also in the parks, in parking lots, in libraries, in the schools. Back in 2020, it was conceived as a um, series of programs that resided at the intersection of nature and the arts, presenting site-specific performances and also embedded and responsive to our landscape. Um, the creation of pathways is probably the proudest achievement of our uh, we are new uh, four year, um, three year uh, programming history, but it's probably one of the proudest achievements of our team uh, to bring beyond our grounds visionary international artists directly to uh, the region and to communities throughout our region with programming that I already mentioned, um, that are also offered free of charge to our communities or at a very low cost. And this is where contemporary circus comes in. Um, for us, pathways and contemporary circus, pathways to each other, to ourselves, to our bodies. Um, it's a linchpin of also a platform of our collaborations with other local and regional organizations. Uh, it's very much the initiative that is a counterweight that has, as we conceived it, to the prohibitive and restrictive, uh, cost prohibitive and restrictive um, participation in the arts in this region, Hudson Valley, but also in the workshops, and uh, I think very much throughout the country. And so in the spirit, new circus that we have been presenting, built upon our mission to increase participation in the cultural commons and also cultural and artistic resources in this area in the Berkshires and Columbia counties. I'm scrolling through it and um, showing you an image of Galmay by Kameni um, Galmay, Sepala uh, Sepala, the wonderful production that we also shared with several other presenters in uh, 2022. So our primary goal of presenting contemporary circus um, uh, several years ago 
was to um, was to expand access to cultural expression and also to privilege public assembly and combat injustices inherent in social economic exclusion. Our aim also was to include um, was to forge cross sector alliances and also organizational alliances with many local organizations when we could co-concede, co co-program uh, different ideas, masterclasses, workshops, collaborations, and um, make sure that everybody, those who don't own second homes, but actually everybody could participate in different kinds of communities. So uh, in, our, in the course of our uh, contemporary service, presentations, we realized that this art form, still new in the United States, um, nowhere here, was ideally suited to engage audiences of all ages and backgrounds, and also to unify different communities that we serve. PS21, thankfully, on 100 acres of land uh, that also has uh, artist housing on site, uh, is uniquely suited for this kind of collaborations where PS21 amenities and also our community orientation dovetail perfectly with the inclusive principles of contemporary circus, uh, positioning us to emerge as an essential incubator and host of this consequential new artistic art form in this country. And we felt that this is an art form of our moment because it, uh, it addresses with chronology some of the success, most successful productions address urgent issues such, such as sustainability, diversity, solidarity, resilience. I am here scrolling through images on uh, this production of Runners by Sifla Putika from the Czech Republic that we co-presented with Tobu. Um, who came to PS21 and we were the only presenter in the United States. And most companies that we bring um, do not come as a for a one-off presentation of several performances. They stay with us for a week on campus, they engage in conversations, um, they give master classes, not just um, and we we really feel that making those performances accessible or free and often held off-site in partnership with other organizations comprising international as well as local resources uh, was our way to defend public space um, accessible to all. And some of those performances, like this one, Franz Shea from Barcode, Acting for Climate Montreal, highlight our equal responsibility and reimagine our relationship with nature. Circus as a platform democratizes participation in the cultural commons. And in this gentrifying area, it is as important as ever. I'm jumping to the image of Anima from France a uh, premiere of Anima, the North American premiere that we have presented last August and September. It's an immersive multimedia installation of photography, large scale moving image projections, and live aerial performance. You see a visual, <coughs> you, you see a visual a suspended acrobat. The um, piece was created by Johnny Goudard, photographer my Boise, who is a theater director from Dijon, and the aerial performance was created by a pretty well-known suspension artist, uh, Chloe Moria. If you are in the position to present this, I highly recommend it. So it's a, uh, it's a wonderful production addressing, uh, with kind of the illusionistic installations and videos of natural uh, landscapes that weaves the visual elements of photography, music, large scale moving projections, and also acrobatics, which is a reflection of our time and inspired by studies in paleoclimatology. Um, I will finish my presentation. This is a curtain call, um, anima curtain call, and I will finish my presentation with our 
images from Amokanama, nine acrobats from Guinea and Trail to, to PS21. And this is uh, an image after the show, one of the workshops with kids. Um, the production itself called Far, we presented at Krellen Park, of the town of Chatham, in the Krellen Park borders with PS91 property. This production drew 800 spectators. It was presented free of charge. And um, this wonderful company stayed with us for a week, giving workshops for kids and drumming, soccer even. And this is a workshop for grown-ups that dancers of the company gave at PS21. I am coming back to thank Rose Wickler and Toku and Mick at that time because I'm Okanama, and we were the only presenter in North America who brought artists from Guinea last August. I'm Okanama was at the age, at the state of inception in 2020 when we took part online at May. And this is how we discovered this company. It took almost four years for us to um, conclude this journey for this incredible artist, very brave artists, uh, to bring them to the United States. So I encourage um, everybody who is interested in um, contemporary service to check out this company. And also, of course, it's an open invitation to visit us um, and uh, next summer. And I am very grateful for all of the work that Ruth has been doing to create this community. And thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to jump, let's see, this is a very, this is a whole different thing. It's her show. So I think I'm going to skip this for now because we're a little uh, over time. So just, I'm going to skip right through. Okay, Lori, now we are here in person. So, okay. Um, So, Lori, I'm so pleased you could be here. Take it away. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so just to give a little context, I'm the Director of Programming and Audience Development at the Quick Center for the Arts. It's nice to see you. And it is located in Fairfield, Connecticut, which is an easy 90-ish minute train ride uh, from Grand Central. And... We are at a we are at Fairfield University, which is a modern Jesuit Catholic university. So you know, sort of a mid sized scale, um, and the Quick Center has been around for about thirty five years now. And I think what's interesting is over that time, I think like any presenter, there's been a lot of evolution of what um, the community has needed and what the Quick Center is able to provide and and who we serve. And so certainly uh, when I moved up to Connecticut to take this job about 10 years ago, um, what was really interesting to me and I think is, is helpful in context is that Fairfield University sits in the town of Fairfield, which is clearly a, you know, a suburban commuter, you know, community, but hugged up against that is Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is the largest city in our state and the most socioeconomically diverse. And so the reality is the way we are serving our community is much broader than I think the, the stereotype that maybe was existing for a long time. And so in that and in the presentations that we were considering, you know, we take a lot of pride in believing that we present the highest caliber of music and dance and theater that you can experience in Fairfield County. Um, and and in that, we really realized that we were we were missing a piece of that puzzle. And so circus definitely became part of that conversation. Some of that stemmed from the fact that as I got to know the community that I was living in, being in Bridgeport, um, the P.T. Barnum Museum is two miles from my front door. And it helped me to understand because I, I didn't grow up with circus the way I think a lot of Americans might have experienced it. Um, our, you know, I, I grew up in North Carolina and I'm sure it came through town, but it was not something my parents took us to. They loved taking us to classical music and chamber concerts and things. It was very different. So um, having missed that, although I knew the Barnum name, I didn't really understand the history. And so in connecting with the executive director and I said, you know, I really want to start thinking about circus Circus, is this going to conflict with the history that exists here? What was exciting is that 
and I, I give her a lot of credit too, is that Kathy was like, no, this is what Barnum would want. Like he would want the evolution of the art form. And, you know, he was an inventor and, and, you know, in those ways, I think we realized we could be a continuation of the history, but also moving it forward. And so in that we've been presenting circus now for about six or seven years. And each year we go, we go from one presentation, we're up to two presentations. It's taking up more of our season, um, which is exciting, especially considering the times and, and the challenges that we face. But what's also really exciting for us is how we've been able to connect circus artists with our broader community. And so an artist I'm going to speak about um, more so is Agat and Adrian. Maybe it makes sense to show the video and then I can jump in more. So what I'll share is um, I was really lucky to first be invited to the um, international marketplace in 2019. I happened to be sitting next to Ruth at a dinner and got the invitation. I was very excited. Um, right place, right time. And in that, um, each year since I've been able to attend the marketplace and learn about circus in a way I don't think I ever could otherwise. And even during that time in COVID, the fact that there was still that access and still that learning was really, really useful for me. Um, and so in that, we actually got the opportunity to, I, I saw the pitch session that I got and Adrian did at at in the 2022 marketplace. Um, and the moment I saw it, I just knew it was work that it, it wasn't completed yet. It was just the pitch really. <laughs> but I was like, this is work that needs to be in our space. And what was unique about it was that it wasn't sort of the stereotype of the work that we had started to become more known for, which is the bigger companies that kind of fill the stage and far more, they're a little more, you know, like the surprise and pow action that, that people start to expect. And what was so beautiful about it is that it's work that really starts to dive into, you know, what it means to be a pair and a, a gendered pair and that lifting and sharing. And suddenly it was a conversation of work that we could present that actually aligned a little bit more with all of the other work we do. Um, as by being at a Jesuit institution, we talk a lot about social justice driven work. And suddenly it gave that space to connect the work curricularly with what we were doing too. It wasn't just about the art. It started to be a lot of other conversations. And in that too, um, I think what's important is that suddenly it helped to shift also the way we work with our broader community. So for example, you know, we ended up having the artist, the duo with us for about three or four days. And in that time, um, we had them, we, we have a special partnership with the Bridgeport Public School System. And we actually had them have permission to do workshops with um, young men who are part of the detention center in Bridgeport. So, and unfortunately I can't, you can't take any photos or video or else I would share it. Um, but to see, a group of young men who are going through a life experience I could never imagine and to be very dubious at first and then to suddenly see Adrian climb up on Agat's shoulders and walk towards them and their eyes just sort of exploded and suddenly they were on their feet and they were ready to do things. And that to me was really transformational. And, and we were working with that partnership with other artists too, but that was the most I'd ever seen. Th those students really sort of explode into the space and want more. 
And, and then in addition, what we found at a university campus is often, I think there's a lot of assumptions that student athletes don't really want to engage in the arts. I think that's a missed opportunity. I think there's plenty who do. But um, the other thing we found is that when we make the call to the athletics program and say, oh, we have these circus artists, this is their specialty, these are the things they're going to share, every team is eager to sign up whether it's men's teams, women's teams. So um, they worked um, back in October with the uh, women's um, field hockey team who are champions. And they took time out of a very busy schedule to take, to do that workshop. And we're totally, by the end, like the coach was being lifted in the air and they were stacking each other. And you could see the determination because it actually was really challenging for them. They were exhausted and they couldn't believe how, what, what the requirements were of the body, but also to see the trade of weight and sharing that happens, especially in a, a male and female body and the assumptions that take place with that. So for us, it's it's been really exciting to work with artists like this because I think they share so much of themselves, but I also think they touch parts of our community that we might otherwise not really be able to, to dive into. And so we're really trying to take that to continue to expand how we're serving. That's me. Um, thank you, Lori. That's amazing. Um, so now we're going to hear from Jed. And um, Jed has been working with Circus for a number of years now. Um, when this moment in the pandemic happened where we created our working groups, um, one of the working groups that I, I asked Jed to co-lead a working group on commissioning. And um, the practice of commissioning is something that's very common for Circus in certain countries. And this is not one of them. And um, but you know, Jed is a, has been a leading commissioner of contemporary performing arts and other disciplines. And so I asked Jed to team up with someone in Berlin who has done this in what can be conceived of as being commissioning work with Chameleon Theater in Berlin um, for many years. It's kind of their business model. And that together they have helmed this group, which he will talk about. So it's it's uh, been really exciting that you've been able to bring your knowledge and commitment to supporting artists' creation in a profound way to this art form. Take it away. Thank you very much, Ruth. That's a, a delightful introduction. Mm -hmm. and thank you, Frank. And you're right. I'm not going to use notes. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Because Lori, yeah. Lori serendipitously, <laughs> inexplicably, but intuitively, gave me a line into this with a gut and Adrian. Adrian. Because I think one of the most important things that I've encountered in the past four or five years in my history with circus um, goes back to. Um, about 68 years ago when I went to the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus and I discovered theater through circus. That's really where I... You let me know when you want me to start with... I'll, I, I'm on you. Don't worry. You know, and then consequently I found myself working with a... Um, in 1986 with a, um, a circus company, uh, Jean-Baptiste Thierry and uh, Victoria Chaplin, um, and the Cirque Imaginaire, which um, I brought to the United States in 1986. And then there was kind of a lapse in time and so forth. Um, but through Ruth and through Tohu and others, I discovered that Circus Today is as fresh, creative expression as I've encountered in 40 years. Um, and I'm not going to place myself in the context of dance, music, and theater and opera history, because I think that would be very boring. <laughs> but I do want to say that what, what uh, uh, you showed, um, that duet, um, emphasizes what I think is singularly important about the direction that circus is going, and, and it's and I think circus is on an upward trajectory. I don't believe, I, I know, we know the history. We got that. But the profound beauty of circus today 
is, is that it doesn't know where it's going. It's going to discover. And discovering circus is, is what audiences love. So if you want to know what audiences is going to find, don't give them anything they already know. Give them something they don't know. And the duet that we just saw um, really will allow me to talk about the company that I commissioned because what we're talking about here is metaphor. I'm trying not to be academic, but see, the transition from the circus that I saw 68 years ago to the circus that I know today is the use of metaphor and story. It's not about spectacle. It's about the means that get us to that moment that we associate with circus, which is wow, except it's not the spectacle. It's the internal emotional evolution of using the vocabulary of circus, of the circus arts that we, we all know because we grew up with it. This is, not, this is not a language we don't know. This is a language we adore, you know? And th those two sweep me off my feet every time I see them. Even in this video, I'm captured, captured, because there's a truth in the physical work that they do. They find, it's not about, I mean, yes, of course, the little one supports the big one. I mean, we got all this, that's cool. But there's a way they approach it that is so human. They're not trying to tell you, I'm amazing. It's their heart that's amazing. That's what they're doing. I love these, these two. And why didn't I know you were doing them? <laughs> What's wrong with your marketing department? That's me too. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> ah, anyway, so yes, I'm part of this this fantasy group called the Utopians, um, which basically Ruth started. I just, you know, like you all know the metaphor of, of the story of running off and joining the circus. Well, I I couldn't do that. I was too old and not necessarily in good shape at that time. I, I've been practicing and I've worked myself up into kind of a physical self. But um, so I joined the Ruth Circus <laughs> and I, I went off to Montreal and began seeing artists uh, that were using, doing things that I had never experienced before in terms of circus. And one of them um, was, uh, a woman named Holly Trednick. And Holly is based in Wedlin, um, Ontario. And yes, you can start. And what Holly's created is a deeply personal story about her relationship with her father. I know, okay. But the issue here, which you will see in these pictures, is that her father was a firefighter and she's an aerialist, she's an acrobat. And she started telling her father's stories, the stories that he told her after his rescues, after his life as a first responder. He came home and told her these stories. And you can begin spinning in your mind the relationship that evolved between a man who rescues and risks. These are familiar terms, are they not for circus? You know, to save people, to save lives, and how that influenced Holly Trednick, who became an expert aerialist and acrobat. And so she tells her story through, you'll see, using the materials that are familiar to firefighters. But they're oddly, as you consider it, these are the same types of tools that we see in circus. And so I found that it's very emotional experience that she 
has made available to audiences called In the Fire. And this little cohort that we put together called the Utopians uh, dreamed up this idea that we would be commissioning and supporting uh, new work because we really wanted to validate new ideas. We really, as a group, and there are about, what, 10 or 12 of us? 16. 16. And we had this brilliant leader, the, another one. We have two brilliant leaders, really. We've got this one, and then we have Anka Poritz from Chameleon in Berlin. And we led a whole group, including Monica, Monica, Monica Martins was part of it. I mean, it was quite a group of yakkers. And uh, we came up with three group, three artists to commission. And one of them was Holly. And what Holly dreamed, what Holly imagined, was that when her stories started coming into life on stage, there would be a chorus. And that we would, and that she wanted to commission, wanted me, as it turns out, to commission um, an eight-person singing group to join her in her telling her fantastical father's stories. So that's what the Utopians ended up doing. Um, and it turns out um, that her father started the Winnipeg Firefighters Association and Museum. Um, and in the United States, in Hudson, New York, is the Volunteer Firefighters Museum and Association. And um, Hudson Hall, which is based in Hudson, has invited her to come and perform there. Um, and so the communication is not is on different levels of how human beings relate to each other, how audiences relate to each other. And um, I can't. And I believe Sonia, who we saw previously, is also part of that. So because she had, and this is the connection. Apparently, she had um, a very sad fire in her theater, um, which caused um, tremendous anguish. And she wants to celebrate the firefighters who helped save her space, if I got the story correctly. So this, is the, this is the level at which I think theater, uh, theater circus is operating on now. It's not, it's not just bring in the clowns. <laughs> Um, which is a whole other aspect of we it. Love hmm? we, love we love clowns. We all love clowns. Oh, don't get me started about the. Oh, please, this is. That's a whole conversation about the misuse of terms. It just it gets ourselves into trouble. Me in particular. Um, so anyway, I just want to congratulate the circus folks that are here. You're onto something. You're really onto something. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ruth, can I stand? Oh, absolutely. But also, I'm going to introduce you. Um, so we um, are so lucky <laughs> this weekend in New York City to have not only this fine panel, but also um, a circus from Cambodia is here at the New Victory. And this is years in the making, and it's extremely exciting. And before they came here, they were in Montreal uh, at Tohu, which was the first time Tohu had ever programmed a company from Asia. So I'm really proud of that, that I did that. And, um, and uh, so really, because the company is here, we're really excited to have both Lindsay from the New Victory and also Xavier from the company to sort of talk about two two angles on the same project of building audiences for contemporary circus with a uh, far circus and white gold as the as the object. And by the way, then another company that is making a landmark return is uh, a clown company from Madagascar is going to be at the Lincoln Center this weekend as well. So it turns out to be quite a consequential consequential weekend for circus. Um, so Lindsay has uh, done wonderful work collaborating. We've collaborated before, and she's quite a genius around the um, art of, of engagement of young people and families around any art form, but particularly circus. And I'm so excited for her to share her knowledge with you. Lindsay, go for it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the I do want to click 
Can you teach me how? That one. I'll do it. Let's try it. A thing happened. Okay, so the first thing to know is that first and foremost, I am a fan of circus. I'm not an expert in circus. I'm a fan. I'm an, I am the audience you built. Okay. So that is my son and I, that's what I'm going to stand up. Um, this is one of his first circuses. His actual first circus is airplay, Acrobufos. Yeah, totally. But this is maybe his second circus. He's about four or five. Um, and we go to a ton of it, but the other new audience in this picture is me because the first time I ever saw a circus was sitting in the new victory seat about a month after I got hired. <laughs> it was Cirque El Waz, a show called Rain, and I bawled because to the point that we've been talking about here, I had no idea that that's what circus could be. And if I think about it now, I actually still get a little choked up because I hadn't watched it. I'd only seen it as reference, as a cultural reference, an American cultural reference, but I hadn't gone. My parents didn't bring me. So when we talk about building new audiences, I think the thing to invite into this room is that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to invite young people as new audiences. But it is also important for me to think that their parents and the grown-ups who are coming with them are also often new audiences, um, just like I was. All right, that's us. We do a lot. At the New Victory, we don't just do circus. Um, we do a lot of everything from everywhere. It's fun. You should come. And we're on 42nd Street. Um, but, nope. Point it right. There we go. Um, but the thing that we realized is that we did some number crunching. We do about three, sometimes more circuses each year. We were opened in 1995 and we realized we've done more than three quarters of a million audiences and a circus in New York since that time. I know, it's so fun. We had never done the math, um, but now we've done the math. So that's the kind of circus um, impact that we're having in New York City right now. And also I've been there since 2004. So we're talking about lots and lots and lots of young people and their families walking through the door to see really amazing circuses that Mary Rose Lloyd, who is our artistic director, who cannot be here today, um, has brought in from everywhere. Cambodia, which we'll talk a lot more about, is our first time, um, our first company from Cambodia, but also Ethiopia and France and Asia, um, lots of places. But the thing, that's pedal punk. Um, why can't I do it? You're going to do it. <laughs> the thing that we wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about is what is happening for the audience who is new in these seats. Um, and so that's going to be sort of the, the main point is like for me to talk about what does the new victory do to prepare an audience to come in to receive this work? Um, and not because the work cannot stand on its own, but because we actually know from research that if you help an audience engage and meet the content before they sit in the seat, they will then self-report a greater impact of that work after having seen it. So we think of it as like, what is the red carpet that we can lead up into the work to make sure that the audience sitting in it is going to have received the most impact they possibly can. And then we're gonna talk about what the impact actually looks like. Cause we have some, I call them maps. Yeah. Can we do the next one? Isn't she great? She's so fun. Okay. so. One of the things we do is it's really important um, for new audiences to get to meet the content, uh, the art form, the themes prior. So that for us means that we are inviting our families to come as part of family workshops to learn how to do the most bare minimum. You have some beautiful pictures of kids on actual uh, performers' backs. That kind of invitation um, into the work and into the themes is really, really key. We do that both in person in schools, um, but we also do it in our lobby. So there's a teaching artist before every single show to try to create that red carpet into the experience. And we do it more and more online. Next one. I don't know if we need to watch these. We can, um, but we started doing arts breaks during the pandemic. Um, this is Brenda Angil from, um, I don't know, from Argentina. Um, they were supposed to come on our COVID season and they sure didn't, but we wanted them to. <laughs> um, 
And then, so this is an example of sort of how we were able to invite our audiences in to see sort of behind the scenes of this work. And then a little bit about how we actually use our teaching artists right now as well. But I think we should skip it. You can go online and Google New Victory Arts Break and you will find all these things. Um, but here's where I want to do it, is we actually spent five years researching all of our programming with young people. And there was some, and they saw the kids that we researched with did saw a lot of circus because we program a lot of circus. Um, and here's some of the things we learned. We look. So the first is that we call these little maps, emotion maps. Um, every show that they would come to, they, the kids would then basically tell us the kind of emotions that they experienced in their seat while they were watching. And we are not saying that those happy emotions are good and that the sad emotions are bad. That's not what we're saying. But it is really interesting that as we looked at the emotion maps that the young people were giving us after watching a circus, that we were seeing them very high up on the sort of excited, thrilled, calm, peaceful, happy, and joyful. Um, for me, this is not because the other emotions are to be avoided, but it is interesting that I think that the absence of words in a lot of the pieces that we were doing actually creates this larger emotional map than was, we were sometimes seeing with our more straight plays, which were seeing smaller maps. So how much the, this map is over um, is somewhat unique to circus is what we were seeing. Can you go to the next one? And then this one, this one's also really fun. Um, so live performance can do a lot of things. Here's what circus we were seeing over and over again that circus was doing that was somewhat specific to the art form. And the first is that right here, social bridging. Social bridging refers to the fact that um, you can go and see a performance and you can feel closer to the person that you went with, but also closer to the people that you're viewing with, even if you didn't come with them, even if they're not your partner. Um, we were seeing that, that circus over and over and over again. People were identifying that they felt closer to the rest of the audience and to the people that they came with than we were seeing tracking for other kinds of performances. And then the other one is over here, motivation to action. Kids were sitting in the seats and then they were like, I wanna do that. I so wanna do that. The fact that these two things are as far out as they are is somewhat unique to this particular art form. We weren't seeing this when we're looking at some of the straight plays, even some of the puppetry work. Um, we weren't seeing that, that over and over again, the art form itself was inviting people to connect and was inviting people to do. Um, and so I wanted to sort of share that back with people who are interested in the circus about what's actually happening in your audiences. But I also wanna connect it to, Wolf Brown actually has done recent research post COVID about what audiences are coming to and what they're, why they're coming to things now. And it's really interesting because the circus maps that we're seeing behind us match up almost exactly to what Wolf Brown is saying that now audiences are saying they want. They wanna feel connected, they wanna feel emotion, they wanna feel excited. And those things are mapping up almost exactly about what the information we have about what's happening. Can you go to the next one? And now I want to bring it back to white gold, which is here right now. So we, um, you saw my son in the beginning, oh, back at four. So now he's almost 11 and he sat next to me last weekend watching white gold. And one of the things that I noticed um, is, and then I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a lot more about it, but um, two things were happening for us in the audience. One is that my son and I leaned toward each other. So while we were watching, his shoulder started to brush mine. It's small, but for an 11 year old boy sitting next to his mother, I'm gonna tell you, this is not like a regular thing that's happening for me anymore. Um, but it did happen while we were watching White Gold and our breath started to synchronize. We started to breathe kind of the same, like especially at moments that were really exciting or really beautiful or where there was emotion that rose. That experience that I have with my own kid is I think one of the most sort of like beautiful things that the audiences, especially new audiences who don't know that this is what circus is now, um, it's a gift that they're receiving. Um, and as we left, I will also tell you that he asked for circus classes for his holiday gift, which I have yet to figure out how to make happen. <laughs> um, but that kind of, that invitation to both of us to have this experience and to watch this beautiful work um, is a gift that you've given me as an audience member. And as I began, 
I am first and foremost an audience of circus. I'm your biggest, biggest fan. Um, and I wanted to turn it over to you to talk more about like the rest of white gold. And then if there are questions about how we're holding around it, we certainly can. Does that work? Yes. Oh, so I'm going to stand as well. <laughs> I think it's cool to stand. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, my name is Xavier Gobin. I'm a, I'm a producer with Far Circus, this company. I, I've been living in Cambodia for eight years, so I know this project uh, more particularly. I speak the language. I spend a lot of time over there. Uh, but I, my, my focus is um, social uh, impact circuses, social impact companies. Uh, so Far is, of course, my, my main partner, but I also work now with Zip Zap Circus in South Africa which is a beautiful project as well. And uh, like FAR, it's 30 years old already, and they are at this point of their development where they want to tour abroad uh, as well. So that's one part of what I want to develop, is how do we, uh, how do we um, start with an NGO, with a local social project, a project that wants to give joy to the children, that want uh, them to blossom, that want them to, gel, uh, to gain self-confidence, how you uh, start from that and you uh, have the ambition to uh, to reach international stages. That's a, a really beautiful thing that we are achieving now with White Gold. And thank you so much, Ruth, for uh, trusting us and inviting us in Mick at the very first place. And thanks, Victor, new Victoria. You've, uh, you've been trusting us a lot and you've been helping us improve uh, right away when we arrived in New York, very concretely. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So FAR is, um, is a social uh, project at first, as I said, and uh, it started in Cambodia. Can you? Yeah, you can go on. Um, it started in the 80s, actually, in the Side 2 refugee camp. Uh, you know, there was a terrible genocide in Cambodia, 75 to 79. And after that, there was also a civil war going on for all the 80s. And there was those uh, refugee camps with hundreds of thousands of refugees living in terrible uh, conditions. And uh, a French humanitarian, her name was Véronique de Crop, she decided to teach uh, art classes, visual art classes, painting, drawing. So uh, she wanted the kids to heal their wounds and to overcome their traumas because they had a terrible, terrible, um, terrible uh, daily life. Of course, there was bombing, there was violence in the camps, there were rapes, etc. So you can go on, Ruth. In uh, 1986, she started those classes. You can go on. Uh, in those uh, those kind of ref refugee camps, you can imagine uh, what was the daily life. That's Veronique. And then you can go on, Ruth. You want me to click? Maybe it'll be easier. It's okay. Then in 1994, the, the, the borders reopened and nine of her students, they decided to continue the adventures. They, they had... They knew how to draw, they knew how to paint, but they, they said it's, 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 it's something beautiful to give to the children that are going to uh, go back to their country. Some of them, they, they didn't know anything about the country. They were born uh, in, in Thailand. Um, I'm going to skip 30 years of history of FAR because I know I can't be too long. And this is FAR nowadays.
So uh, you, as you see, it's extremely diverse. You have uh, theater classes, dance classes. Uh, you have uh, circus, of course. You have music. You have uh, painting and drawing, still sculpture, animation, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 1,000 students today, 500 artistic students, 150 professional artists. That was a big, a major development in 2013. We were able to open a big top near to the Temple of Angkor. Uh, the temples of Angkor, you have many, uh, and that's that's a place where you have 4 million tourists every year. So that was a place where we could imagine making income thanks to a daily show. And that's what happens now. We have a daily show. We have several productions uh, in this in this big top, uh, alternating, rotating for uh, 150 artists to, to, to earn their revenue. And then 70% of the benefits we make from that circus tent goes go back to the to the NGO so running costs of the NGO are partially covered uh, by the work of the beneficiaries themselves you can go on Ruth and so what brings us back to the to the theme of the conference one the last development was how do we reach out to international audiences and so uh, we we decided uh, we thought a lot about it and we were like how 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 are we going to make a difference with the international circuses. I mean, there's no comparison. We, we don't have the same means. We don't have the same schools. There's no way they're going to reach the same level of execution. Let's, let's face it. And we decided to stick to our identity, which, which is social. So we decided to talk about uh, issues of Cambodia nowadays. And I, I think uh, that's what makes the audience kind of attracted. We talk about Cambodia, but Cambodia of today and in white gold, for example, uh, it's the confrontation between Buddhism tradition and consumerism nowadays in Cambodia. It's very, um, it's it's a very concrete issue, and I think we feel it when we see the show. So we are telling a story. We're not. We have some tricks. We have some stunts, and uh, I think the kids are really loving them, of course. But we are also telling a very concrete story, and and I think we get very emotional seeing the show, and that's because we incorporate some elements that are very local. In the music, we mix tra traditional instruments of Cambodia and tin cans because it's a country where you do a lot, where you see a lot of recuperation from trash, you know, it's a mix of all that. Uh, we have rice, which figures money, which figures uh, greed, which figures conflict uh, because of the work uh, and, and the workers being totally um, denied and totally uh, despised. Uh, and we have visual art as well. We have those wonderful painters that come out of the association as well. And the paintings are here to tell, uh, to give a path to the to the main characters and, and really to deliver a Buddhist message. Um, and so that's what I think uh, helped us stood out, stand out of uh, other productions. Um, and that it's a, it's a, it's a project that uh, tours since 2019 uh, and for the first time in North America. Thanks again for the, for the invitation. You can go on Ruth. The, those are some pictures, as you see, our painter, traditional dancer of Cambodia, uh, the Apsara dance, and then one of the stunts that maybe your son was uh, <laughs> was uh, maybe uh, feared, uh, feared by. The next thing, uh, uh, an image of white gold, the rice balls uh, with the capitalist uh, character. Um, so yeah, to conclude, I think our our. Yeah, our goal for, to target new audience, audiences on our side was really to talk about the identity of the country and and really not being ashamed of uh, the social project that we ha we we are at the at the very roots of the association. I got goosebumps this morning when uh, there was a deaf and mute artist, we, which is in our show. is is an artist since uh, since he's ten years old. Really, he's deaf and mute, but he really is capable of doing everything. He's an amazing clown, an amazing dancer, an amazing acrobat. And there was this uh, this audience in, uh, of deaf and mute children, and I was like, wow. So that's thanks of the job, thanks to the job of New Victory, of course, because I've never seen that in Europe. I've never seen a theater bringing so much uh, so much deaf and mute children. And I mean, the role model that they have on stage, seeing this artist doing all those stuff, and then the conversation, the talk back that we had after, and them signing and, and con conversating. And I was amazed that the language was the same as well, the, 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 the language, the, yeah. Uh, so that was really beautiful. And that's thanks to the preparation work that you were talking before. Um, so I think it, it really reaches, it, it's a complete experience. Uh, and thanks to Vic New Victory, it's, it really goes back to the, to the roots of our, of our social work over there in Cambodia. Thanks so much. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe we just finish with that. Um, so the the um, uh, I would just say that in the first slide, when I gave the context, I mentioned that um, uh, there has been a brain a talent drain towards the elite training schools from countries that don't support uh, don't have government support for the create new creation in circus, um, and that is and the companies that are staying and making work in those countries are making work that is um, culturally specific and it's really rich and uh, very important. And so I think what you're saying is, is really important to say that um, when artists look back on the richness of their own cultural heritage, that's where they find something that is does speak to audiences around the world. And um, it's when they try to be universal that the inequality of between different countries in terms of access to elite athletic training and that kind of thing really comes out. So it's kind of like, um, I think it's in the richness of the cultural specificity that we have more of a global um, offer of work that circulates because of what people have to say and express and not just the question of, can you do it better than this other person who couldn't access, you know, there's a real inequality uh, globally around who can access elite athletic training and who can't. So, um, okay. So, yeah. Do you want do you want to say something? Just something to add on to that, um, because um, white gold is getting standing ovations at the New Victory right now, which is not actually all that rare. I mean, it's not all that common at the New Victory. Kids don't necessarily know to stand when they appreciate something. And to your point, I actually think it's because of the emotion. Um, that they are experiencing. The feats are amazing to watch, but I think that the standing ovations are actually coming because to all of your points, the vulnerability and the emotional impact of the story and of the performers is impacting them in a different way than if they were just simply seeing the most technical, like the most technical is amazing, but it doesn't necessarily always make you stand on your feet. I, I have the impression, I don't know exactly, but I have the impression, uh, it's the, the first day I stepped in far in back in 2008, I was completely amazed by the, the urge they had to, to express themselves artistically. And I feel, even though now they are professional artists since many years, I feel they still have that. I feel there's something about if they were not doing this, they would be uh, trash pickers, you know? And, and I, 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 there's something very, very strong that I feel every time I watch far, and it's been 15 years. <laughs> Um, Tome, can you help? Can you put us onto the slide that says Monique? It's the fourth or fifth variable. Yeah. Um, I want to just cl close with the last video that we hadn't shown. Um, very so big, a, atomic, very beginning, number five or six. Um, uh, Monique Martin is has been a presenter of circus and um, uh, was part of the. Down. Center education cohort that I mentioned earlier um, when she was at summer stage and in recently has decided that she's going to make a circus okay. and is is in the process of creation um, and so she's you know she does she is American she's based here in New York and she is also has this long-term exposure to a lot of the work that we're talking about so um, I just want to share with you a little teaser that she has of her work in progress that she she was meant to be here with us but is in um, Abidjan at the moment. The central question in making for circus is what is freedom, feel, and sound like? if your only access to it is through your imagination. The journey explores liberation spaces, oasis spaces, and joy spaces for black and brown bodies and found sovereignty. We celebrate the power of black music as a healing, alchemical, transformative force, a ritual, a portal, the joy, and an invitation to tap in to your imagination
Um, so she sends her greetings. Okay, um, we have very little time. Um, we also have amazing artists in the audience that could have easily been up here. So uh, I want to, um, maybe I can ask um, just, is there, would you guys like to add anything to what has been said from your perspective or? Um... I would love to ask, make it Maybe you can ask, up. yeah, you can ask a question too. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm on camera. Hi, I'm Mark Lonergan. Um, I'd love to ask a question, and this is not the most artistic question, but it's a question that I, uh, I'm currently obsessed with. And I was asking Xavier about this earlier. At this time, not just in New York City, but throughout the United States, we read story after story as one of you referred to theaters that are closing that are yeah you said closing or reducing their seasons or laying people off it's doom and gloom if you open the new york times art section or american theater or any of these places you just constantly bombard it however every circus performance that i've either done with my company or that i have seen since the pandemic has been packed so I would love if any one of you have a thought about this as to why this might be happening. Is this happening? Am I imagining this is happening? I'm just curious about this. Like, is circus the great exception? Is that yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> I mean, I can say it's not for us, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, the audience that's excited to see it is there, but it's not suddenly selling more so than before or more than other art forms that we present. Um, but we're also still early in that relationship. So had we had a deeper relationship prior to that, I wonder if that would have been different. But I think those who do come are um, very enthusiastic and often surprised by what they're experiencing. Even if they knew they were coming to see circus, they still seem to have sort of this elation of um, how incredible it really was. And I, for some reason, I think sometimes we walk in with a more negative attitude than we realize we have and that that the art form actually sort of takes over. So, but that's for us. See, Lindsay, do you wanna, you had said it's doing, this particular show is doing well, but I don't... This show is doing well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, I think that the fact of audience behavior right now doesn't is, is not that circus is the sole exception of the audience behavior, but I would say um, I think that when we hear what audiences are hoping to experience when they go, that it is a very good match for what circus can offer. And that would hopefully um, mean that more and more people will present and produce circus since it seems to be a very good match for what it is people are hoping for in a performing arts experience. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how, from which point of view, from which angle I can talk because I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not a presenter. Uh, I come from the ballet world. I was a ballet dancer, I was telling you before. And uh, to me, uh, I'm very glad that uh, I'm now uh, involved with circus. I find it more popular. I find it less elitist. And I, I stopped being a ballet dancer because I thought it was too narrow-minded. Uh, this speaks to every audience. And there's the thrill of the stunts that is still here. And I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't leave that. Even if we go into more contemporary forms and we tell stories and it's more theatrical and there's uh, music or paintings eventually involved and everything, I, should, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't lose the like, tension of the skill of the, of the trick. I think that's really, really appealing. So um, I, I love this art form, obviously, and I'm uh, I'm glad it. It's also a great tool for uh, for kids to blossom, and that's the that's the very root of the project I accompany, uh, and and that's immediate, and uh, kids enjoy right away, and they can they can do amazing things after two years of practice, which is not the case with classical music or ballet. Let's face it. <laughs> so I think it's for all those reasons, it's a great art form. Most probably also um, circus reacts with space, activates a space. I think it creates an experience um, for that very moment it happens in a space, in a much perhaps stronger level inside the theater, but also outside. So I think and it's all about relations. Um, it's all about movement and it's all about experiencing. 
and as you said, emotions. And I think uh, um, circus is just very, very good at activating that. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to your question as a consumer. <laughs> okay, um, affordability. Um, ticket prices for circus are less than the ticket prices for dance, theater, opera. And that's a major factor. And that's a warning that should go out. <laughs> Leave it at that. I'm Christina Gelsone. Uh I'm not home for any more than two weeks for the next year because I'm constantly on tour. I just came from Saudi Arabia. I'm about to go to Chile. And my heart is pumping in my chest because I'm leaving the field. Uh, because you, when you speak on the stage of this panel, you talk about how beautiful contemporary circus can be. And as an American artist, I feel a strong whiplash. For a moment, Jed, you made a joke about clowns. and I am a clown. I'm a very successful clown. When I'm in the US, I'm treated, and I've been told by programmers to my face that I'm great for preschoolers. And when I was at the Adelaide Festival, the second largest festival in the world, outside of Edinburgh, I was considered a major artist. And I was pushing forward the field of clowning, and I was treated with incredible respect. Part of that whiplash of being an American is not being monetarily supported. There's a lot of talk about diversity and supporting diversity. And I am an artist that was able to make enough of a career to be able to invest in my own show to the tune of $150,000 eight years ago. We still have not made that money back. And I have had one of the most successful mind-bending careers that anyone could imagine. Sold out Tohu during their whole holiday run. Uh, have been formed, performed in dream theaters, the biggest theater in Singapore, the biggest theater sold out, scalping tickets for me in Shanghai. I was making a new show. If you want diversity, if you want new voices, you're going to have to support them because I cannot, knowing that it took me eight years of massive success not to, to make back the money that I invested in my own show, that I don't have the funds knowing that I need I don't get a 401k, I don't get insurance that the rest of you on the stage possibly have. I've never made, I'm always the least paid person in the room and when I make my shows, I'm expected to make them for free, that I invest my own time. And I cannot continue in this field, I don't feel supported in my own country. I won't be performing airplay beyond our final performance in the US. finishing off the theater that supported us the most in Cleveland. And so uh, I'm sorry that I'm so shaky, but I'm 50 years old in the US with the whiplash I'm treated and talked to as if I'm a very young artist who doesn't understand the economy as an, oh, you poor thing, can't you just make another, can't you just? And I'm grateful for what my nonverbal theater has given me permission to do around the world and how connected I am to audiences. And people are crying, people are exploding, people are standing on their feet no matter what language they speak. I have value, I know I do. And I know that there are other American artists that also have value, but they are not being treated or being given that value. Um, usually I can speak about this with like more courage, but you're seeing, um, you're seeing me at the end. And I'm going to be in 10 countries next year. And I'm going to continue having a beautiful, beautiful career that I self-funded. Um, and I've seen commissions happen, and I've seen commissions happen for international companies. And I've always wondered, why was I always the one for preschoolers in the States? Why wasn't I considered someone that was a great artist in my own country? So, this very same conversation, you guys saw that in 2009, there was a thing where they were like, hey, contemporary circus, US, try it out. So that was, what, 14 years ago? And the same conversation's happening again, and it's still international artists coming in. You guys, I leave it to you.
Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, um, how does America support? And um, as you said earlier, France, Canada, others invest much, much more. Um, or maybe even in your context, you know, what, what can be done better to support and let American artists create their work? And, you know, the models, first of all, thank you for everything that you have done to advance this art form in from here. Um, well, there's a, you know, I, I, oh, I, I uh, if I somehow I hurt you, I didn't mean to. That wasn't. I'm sorry. I mean, I have a whole spiel about how our culture, that is the American culture, demeans circus. How that term is used in order that's that political activity is a circus. That isn't a compliment, you know. And I think we should go back and look at language. And and with the word clown is, I mean the is the most respected art form I know, because the what the clown does for me is is an internal experience that becomes external. Let's leave it at that. I do think we're in a lot of trouble in this country. There is no category for circus in any in any philanthropy, public or private. It's always tucked in someplace else. It's an afterthought. And circus is actually the first art form for me. Historic, we even saw a, in a presentation, we go back to Egypt. Where does circus come from? We don't, resp and I'm gonna say this with some reservation, we don't respect circus the way we respect dance or theater or opera or even performance. It's a huge problem. Why? Why? When are we going to grow up and understand the source of our intellect is circus, really is? But also, you know, in, in the U.S., there has been... Um... You know, it's very difficult to maintain a company for any performing art form, uh, just because the structure, you know, favors the the temples of of nonprofit, you know, armature and independent artists. It create the act of creation is unsupported. Um, living as an artist is uns unsupported. So it, it it's not just only circus. It's it's a broader issue that um, is you know, when presenters access work from abroad, they are accessing work that has been completely supported throughout its entire creation life, and the artists themselves are, and uh, the theater that it brings them in benefits from that, and, you know, it's un un unspoken. So you're naming something. You're not the only one. I mean, it's an endemic systemic issue here. I mean, I think there's just so many layers to it, and we've I mean, certainly talked about it and I've talked to Margaret. I mean, there's a few, and I think it's interesting. I mean, for as somebody who's still learning a lot and understanding it for myself, I think there's so many layers. It's not just the lack of funding, it's the understanding and advocacy of the institutions who do receive funding to also, it shouldn't just be on the artist's back to advocate that circus is a check mark, right? It is up to institutions to ask of that too. And, you know, for example, I've made it sort of a, a mission that every time I present an artist in front of um, New England presenters, because we have a, an event that happens every year, that I present a circus artist. If I'm if I'm chosen, it's always circus. Um, and that I always speak, even if it's an international artist, I always still also speak about American artists as part of my presentation, even though I'm not supposed to. Um, but, but in part because there are circus artists in our backyard that people don't even know about. And so it's important, like I think it's much more you know, it, it is my responsibility to understand where I am in that framework and to continue to do that advocacy. But I know for a lot of presenters, they're like, well, we don't do circus, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, you're missing out. And so part of it I'm realizing is like, I'm just having to start from the very bottom. And I can only imagine what that's like as the artist who's like, I've been doing this. I'm seen in this way. Why is it not being? And I think part of it, the conversation is in some ways people, I think in the U.S. people see circus as entertainment. And therefore, it's somehow a lesser art form. 
I really do. And I think that's so missed. And that somehow, because it might be for families, that it's somehow less. And I'm like, no, actually children should be experiencing the highest quality of work, right? And so I think it's just so many layers of our society that are very messy and it's not a good answer, but I think it is something we have to continually work at um, because it is an incredibly missed opportunity to not be able to support the artists that are in our backyard. But here at this panel, we have many people who have really fought for this and um, continue to do so. And, um, you know, things are growing and developing. I feel, I do still feel optimistic. Um, yeah, maybe one more um, comment, question, um, anything. Uh, maybe every one of you talk about your upcoming project. Doesn't have to be long. What are you, what's in the pipeline? What are you baking? What's new? I start. Uh, okay, so on ZipZap side, we have a fantastic show that's going to start touring in Europe. Uh, it's called Moya, and it's about the resilience of a, of a street kid uh, in Cape Town, and that's exactly what uh, the kids in ZipZap face. Uh, ZipZap does an amazing uh, outreach work even more than far i would say they go in the shanty towns of cape town which are huge and much more violent it's a it's a totally another context so that's a beautiful creation and with far uh we we are gonna create a new show uh, tackling the plastic pollution in southeast asia so also a very concrete theme uh because i don't know if you've if you've traveled to southeast asia but that's uh it, it's a bit of a, of a hell over there uh considering the plastic pollution so we're going to address uh, a message uh, through that new creation, like we do in, in all the other shows. So the new victory for the rest of this season, we're supporting White Gold. Uh, and then 360 All-Stars is coming back to us. And then a circus called I'm Possible, uh, which is an American circus uh, that is full of performers who are also disabled in some way, but is awesome. And I'm really excited about how that's going to push the new victory around accessibility as well. And then we'll keep doing it over and over and over again as much as we can. What am I working on? I'm 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 in a position where I'm I'm a, an encourager. Um, I'm not actually working on anything specific, but I do have the good fortune of living not too far from uh, Chatham, New York, PS Twenty One, and uh, I'm uh, encouraging Elena and PS Twenty One and other venues in the Hudson Valley to coalesce around a uh, a circus festival that embraces not just the international, but the national artists that we have. That's what I'm up to. I'm pushing. I got one. Um, uh, the Quick Center will be presenting a company flip for Breek this spring for the first time. Um, but I think my work is most focused on um, in the in the circus world. I'm the co-facilitator for the U.S. Presenters Group, and really trying to find ways to keep all of us connected, to get more and more people at the table um, when we have our Zoom calls, and to make sure that we're talking about a lot of different kinds of circus, um, both as education and in order to first all present the, you know, the most work possible. Um, and then continuing to try to find partners and ways to, to just be excited and support the work. So. What are you? What am I doing? Well, I am, uh, I'm consulting with Tohu. I'm not uh, uh, part of their staff anymore. So, but I'm continuing to fight the good fight and advocate through um, various professional you platforms. You run the market? Uh, so the next uh, Mick market is next summer in July, same. So um, yes, I'm advising on it. Mm -hmm. And for our viewers also, is there a place, a central place where people could find out what's happening in the circus world? Is there a website? Is there um, something American or global where people just can look up? There's a website called Circus Talk, and it has a lot of articles, um, kind of anything that happens to, since, tends to surface on Circus Talk. Um, dot com, dot org? Or dot com. Mm -hmm. dot com. They're based here. There is also the American Circus Alliance, mm -hmm. which offers a lot of different resources and information. And it also notes all of the U.S. touring artists. So if you want to know who's out there, it is on that resource. I also share that at all the things I go to. 
So let's see where we'll all be going. And uh, in the very beginning, we referred to it to artists, theater artists in the 70s and 80s, how complicated it also was for them and um, what a struggle um, and how complicated it is. And that it's time now to figure out for this country, you know, to support its artists and um, to uh, create experiences for the people living for that short moment of planet Earth and what's worthwhile to really you know, spend your time. And I do think it's theater as performance, but also especially um, um, circus. So um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being with us, Ruth, for uh, also flying in and uh, making this happen. Um, at seven o'clock, we have a short film. Maybe you tell something about it, um, Xavier. So the film we're going to see uh, at 7 p.m. was directed by Joel, who is here. <laughs> Hi, Joel. Thanks for coming. And uh, thanks so much for organizing this, Ruth. So it's uh, it's a it's a film called Cirque du Cambodia. Uh, maybe it's better you talk about it, Joel, because you have a much better English accent than I have. <laughs> Hello, and uh, hopefully you all stick around to see the film. It's Xavier mentioned called Cirque du Cambodia. So I travel. I was living in uh, Bangkok uh, for twelve years, and through my travels, I ended up at Far Circus. Through a, uh, an interesting set of circumstances. Uh, if you see this film, you'll figure, you'll see that for yourself. Uh, but immediately, immediately, I felt the magic of Far. I mean, it just uh, it was like a lightning bolt that hit me when I saw it, and I saw all the things that you're talking about, and and the energy, and you know, the, all the things that you're saying. I, I I had loved the circus as a kid. Um, grew up here in, in the city and I went to Madison Square Garden a couple of blocks away to see the Ringling Brothers show every year. Uh, that, but I mean, I, I, I had the greatest associations, um, but I hadn't really been connected to the circus world. But I was traveling through Cambodia, found out about this circus uh, that was in this kind of rural village. Um, nothing else really around it, uh, but inside this makeshift kind of circus tent they put on the most beautiful show and it just uh as a filmmaker who had done short films i just knew that this was something i could really wrap my head around and spend a lot of time getting to know better and even though it was about six or seven hours from bangkok where i was living uh, i made the trip on probably 20 times just to come back to film and uh and I don't want to give everything away, but two of the students from FAR decided that they wanted to become the first Cambodians to take the stage with uh, Cirque du Soleil. So to me, that seemed like a pretty amazing arc to follow. And I stayed with these two characters for eight years through four countries. So if you stick around and see the film, you'll see what happens and if they make it or not. Uh, but uh, that's my story and that's the film. Yeah. Yeah, so wonderful. So really, thank you all on the panel. Thank you here in the audience. Thanks to HowlRound. Thanks to Tomek up there. And um, I do think um, it is pointing the finger um, to the future, um, this art form. And uh, the circus artists itself, of course, are the moon the finger is pointing to. But I think um, it is it has I've never looked, I think, as, as strong as a... Um, as a um, possibility that this will really um, take root, that the tree will also stand and live long. So thank you.